Living on the edge of the world is not really a concept that resonates much with me today, but for the people living on St. Kilda it was different. For they really were living on the edge of the world, at least until the 20th century arrived at their doorstep, to change their way of life, arguably belonging to one of the last hunter-gatherer societies in the western world. St. Kilda is an archipelago comprising of five small islands, which are the remains of a large volcano active some 55 million years ago. It is located some 340 kilometers northwest of Glasgow and about a thousand kilometers southeast from Rakem, making up the westernmost islands of the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. Geologically, it is notable for its incredible sea stacks such as Stack and Armin, which is the highest sea stack in the British Isles at 191 meters, and Stack Lee, a bit shorter at 172 meters. The whole northern face of Conacher, the tallest peak of Herta Island, is a vertical cliff that reaches up to 427 meters, the highest sea cliff in the UK. In terms of wildlife, it has one of the largest bird colonies in the world, with hundreds of thousands of birds and different species nesting here. And historically, it is this massive bird population which made it possible to live on these islands, providing its human inhabitants with enough food to survive here for some 2,000 years. But it all came to an end, when on the 29th of August 1930 the last remaining inhabitants boarded a ship never to return, leaving their homes and heritage behind. So let's talk about it. What do we know about the history of St. Kilda? How exactly did the people survive here? And why did they leave? Let's roll. Evidence shows that people have been inhabiting or passing through this area since the Neo Lithic era, as recent archaeological finds show pottery from the Iron Age and even some shards that might be from the Bronze Age. It is likely that St. Kilda was occupied during the Iron Age period, although no building-like structures have been found. Continuous habitation is confirmed to have happened around 1 AD, so roughly 2000 years ago, and all of the population since then has lived on Herta Island, the largest of the islets. It was only in 1202 that the first ever written account about the islands was written in Norse sagas, confirming that the Vikings visited the islands, though they have not left any physical evidence of doing so. So how exactly did the population manage to survive on these islands without any help or contact from the outside world? In a nutshell, they learned to climb and ate a lot of puffins, a local delicacy. Catching the birds was not easy. During the spring and summer months, the men clambered barefoot down steep cliff faces on ropes and collected young birds and eggs from their nests. Nothing was wasted. Feathers were used to stuff pillows and bedding. The skin of gannets were used to make shoes. They ate the meat and eggs of fulmars, razor bills, guillemots, gannets, puffins, shearwaters and great auks. The birds were available for only half of the year as during the autumn months and winter they headed out into the Atlantic Ocean. To prevent themselves from starving, the islanders built cleats where they stored the carcasses of the birds. According to one report, each person on St. Kilda ate about 150 in Fulmars every year, and in 1876 it was said that the islanders had consumed more than 89,600 puffins on the island. I don't know where that number comes from, but they ate a lot of puffins no matter what. It is quite unlikely that any population would have managed to survive on this island if it were not for this abundant resource, especially as food delivery logistics, nothing like that existed for them. The islanders also kept sheep and a few cattle and were able to grow a limited amount of food crops such as barley and potatoes. But overall the island isn't suitable to growing crops because of the extremely windy climate. There are also abundant fishing and marine resources, though the villagers often avoided fishing since it was perceived to be more dangerous than cliffhanging and trying to get into birds nests. The seas really are quite treacherous. Periods of famine did occur, but nowhere in Britain was really immune to such tragedies. And given the option, living on St. Kilda in 1880 was significantly better than being an industrial worker somewhere in the slums of Glasgow or Manchester, putting in 14 hour work days and sleeping in a room with 12 other people. But once complete isolation ended, the tiny population started suffering from diseases, which commonly ravaged European population centers, as visiting ships in the 18th century brought with them cholera and smallpox, often devastating the population. In 1727, most of the island died out from the diseases, and too few residents remained, and new families were brought in to replace them. By 1758, the population climbed back up to 88 and reached just under 100 by the end of the century. This was still much less than it had been the previous century when the population had been recorded to reach 188 at its peak. 
The islanders' isolation and dependence on the bounty of the natural world meant their philosophy bore as much relationship to Druidism as it did to Christianity. As the existence of Druidic altars, large stone circles were found on the island. It was not until 1822 that the island's population was converted to Christianity through the work of one very insistent revenant. The island became extremely devoted thereafter, with Christianity taking over much of the inhabitants' daily lives. Still, even in the middle of the 18th century, the islands were desperately hard to reach, and there was no real line of communication between the inhabitants and mainland. Many of the residents did not even speak English, mostly just Gaelic, and considering how rough the local seas were, most never bothered to leave the island. The main means of communication included lighting a bonfire on the summit of Conacher, which would be visible to those on the nearest other islands, assuming that the weather permitted it, or by using a St. Kilda mailboat. The Kildans would fashion a piece of wood into the shape of a boat, attach it to a bladder made of sheepskin, and place in it a small bottle or tin containing a message. Then it would be launched during favourable wind conditions. Two-thirds of these messages landed on the west coast of Scotland, but sometimes also in Norway. Things really started to change when tourists and other ships started visiting the islands regularly in the 19th century. These visitors more or less introduced currency to the island and gave the locals an opportunity to start selling their wares or food items to various travellers. Even the islanders themselves started venturing overseas, and the increasing contact with the outside world made them aware of a different way of life and their own inadequacies on the island. The residents began importing food, fuel and building materials in a bid to improve life, and gradually they became dependent on outside supplies. First talks of an evacuation occurred in 1875, but despite occasional food shortages and a flu epidemic in 1913, the population was content and stable between 75 and 80 inhabitants. Early in the First World War, the Royal Navy erected a signal station on Herta Island, and daily communications with the mainland were established for the first time in its history. In response, a German submarine arrived in Village Bay on the morning of 15th of May 1918, and after issuing a warning, started shelling the island. 72 shells were fired, and the new station was destroyed. Luckily, there was no loss of life, except for one unlucky sheep. As a result of this attack, a 4-inch Mark III was erected overlooking Village Bay, but they never saw action against the enemy. The presence of the Royal Navy on the island improved communication with the mainland, and for the first time in history, there were regular deliveries of mail and food. When these services were withdrawn at the end of the war, feelings of isolation intensified, and food shortages became more acute and more frequent, not to mention that the lack of medical care was sorely missed. So the changes made to the island by visitors throughout the 18th and 19th centuries and the First World War slowly disconnected the islanders from their hunter-gatherer roots, which had allowed their ancestors to survive and even thrive on the islands for two millennia. After the First World War, most of the young men left the island and the population fell from 73 in 1920 to just 37 in 1928. The last straw came with the death of a young woman, Mary Gillies, who fell ill with appendicitis in January 1930 and was taken to the mainland for treatment. She later died in the hospital, highlighting the dangers of living in an isolated community. The remaining group was no longer willing to endure the struggles of the island and to risk their lives to stay, as the idyllic life on a distant island no longer seemed better than that of the modern 20th century England. Not to mention that most of the youth had already left, meaning there were few strong individuals left to do manual labour, farming or to catch any more birds. And in all likelihood, the gene pool was getting a little bit shallow. The islanders sent a petition in May of 1930 requesting the UK government to evacuate them. This evacuation commenced on the 29th of August 1930. St Kilda was about to join a long list of Scottish islands that were destined to be depopulated. The last surviving St Kildan, Rachel Johnson, died in 2016 at the age of 93. She was 8 years old when she evacuated the islands. Today, St Kilda is mostly associated with images of epic travel, an exotic, extremely hard to reach island, a lifelong dream for many who wish to visit its pristine shores. And still, St Kilda is the biggest seabird colony in the UK. It is untouched and predator free, giving scientists a very clear picture of the effects that climate change is producing on seabirds in general. The outlook in that regard, of course, is quite negative. In 1955, the British government decided to incorporate St Kilda 
into a missile tracking range, where test firings and flights are carried out. And thus in 1957, St. Kilda became permanently inhabited once again. Tourists usually find the presence of a military base quite a surprise. It became one of Scotland's six World Heritage Sites in 1986, and is one of the few in the world to hold joint status for both its natural and cultural qualities. With no permanent residents, the island's population can vary between 20 and 70, most of whom stay temporarily. These inhabitants include Ministry of Defence employees, National Trust of Scotland employees, archaeologists and several scientists working on the Soy Sheep Research Project, a far cry from the hunter-gatherer society which existed here on what was once thought to be the edge of the world less than only 100 years ago. Now check out this vintage relief map of England and Wales which I designed, combining modern satellite imagery with a vintage map. Please consider supporting me by hanging this up in your home. Simply visit geoperspective.org. There I am slowly building out a collection of maps and it's the best way to support this channel. Also, this is my Patreon map. Consider placing yourself on this map by donating to me on Patreon and ensuring the continuation of more content just like this. Now guess where this footage was taken by leaving a comment and I will see you soon. Geoperspective out.